All right, so officially on the world correct times 10 a.m. We're time to start. We're going to be in Revelation 11. Wrapping up Revelation 11, pushing on in chapter 12. Revelation 11, going into 12. And if I could ask Andrew, would you lead us in prayer, please, to start the class? Dear God in heaven, thank you so much for this day that we have to come to learn more about your word. We pray that we apply these things to our lives and be with the teachers who are prepared the material. Thank you so much for everything you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, Revelation chapter 11, we're going through, we've been in the midst of the seven trumpets. This last trumpet is what we're going to study, the seventh trumpet, of course. We've just talked about the two witnesses. The, the scene is given to us of them going out declaring the word of God, being associated with apostles, prophets, with those powers and things that they had, that the world rebelled against them, is angry at them, they're killed, they leave their bodies out, the world rejoices over the fact that they have been killed, but then they're resurrected and they're caught up to the in a cloud, they go to heaven, and the idea that the world cannot touch them any longer. Uh, Revelation 11 now, verses 15 to 19, is that final trumpet being sounded. And we want to see in this that God's cause is triumphant. In Revelation 11, 15 to 19, who will read that for us? Chris. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there was loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of the world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sat before God on the throne fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord, God Almighty, the One who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath, and your wrath has come. And the time for the dead, that they should be judged. And you, excuse me, and that you should reward your servants and prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, small and great. You should destroy them and should destroy those who have destroyed the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of the covenant was seen in His temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquakes, and great hail. Okay. So 15, verse 15 that is, talks about these loud voices in heaven and saying, kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. There's a sense in which the entire world is the kingdom of God. There's, there's that overall sense about you know, the Lord, as the psalmist said, is Lord over the cattle over a thousand hills. He, he has this rule that is universal. But not everybody recognizes him in that position of authority and rulership. They don't respect that authority. Here, that declaration is being given that the kingdoms of the world have become the kingdoms of our Lord. He's not saying he has universal rule. He's always had that. It's saying here he has ultimate victory. This is a victory uh, declaration, if you will. And you see then that there's this picture of God on his throne when it talks about these 24 elders who sat before 
God on their thrones, fell on their faces and worshiped God. Where's, where did we see these individuals before? What was the scene being painted for us? Do you remember? In the beginning of Revelation, when there were 24 elders who were around the throne, they fell and uh, cast the crowns at that point. Exactly. Back. Yes, exactly. In Revelation 4, it's almost the exact same scene that's being depicted for us here. If you will kind of think of Revelation 4 as an opening scene, and this is kind of a closing scene, and we'll talk more about that in just a minute, but you've got them here before God, worshiping Him, praising Him, and notice what it says there, verses 17 and following. It talks about, we give you thanks, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was. And then you've got a footnote, and who is to come. What, for those who have the New King James Version, what does your footnote say there? Did anybody look that up? Okay, omit and who is to come. So how would that read then, Rick? The one who is and who was. Who is and who was. So, there's two, just a very brief background, there's two kind of major lines of textual evidence for the Bible for the modern translations we have in English. One line would be the King James and the New King James, which would include and who is to come. The other line would be like the New American Standard, the English Standard Version, and it omits that the, the text that they lean on omit and who is to come. And the thinking is that the who is to come doesn't belong in this verse. That it's the Lord God Almighty who is and who was. And the reason is because this section here is pointing to here's the final judgment. Here's the seventh trumpet. Here's the end of it all. When he goes on to say in verse 18, the nations who were angry and your wrath has come and the time of the dead that they should be judged. So the dead are being judged here. And what's he going to do with his servants? And who's included in that? Reward them. Servants, the prophets. The saints, those who fear your name, small and great. When you go through the New Testament and you read about the children of God being rewarded, it consistently talks about being rewarded in the judgment, having a reward in heaven. And here, my understanding, I know there's some other views on this, but my understanding is you've got the final judgment being pictured here. We're going to come back and explain in just a minute why there's a wrap-up in 11 and then in chapter 12 something else begins to unfold. But what's he going to do with those who destroy the earth and who would those people be? Latter part of 18. He's going to destroy them. What If there's everlasting life, what's on the other side of that? Everlasting damnation, everlasting destruction. Uh, some people take that to be destroyed like they don't exist anymore, but that's not the sense, that's not the idea, that's not what he's meaning here. He's saying he's calling them to account, he's holding them uh, or sentencing them to that everlasting destruction. And then in verse 19, what is pictured? What does he see here? Okay, the temple of God, but there's something unique that's pictured here. The ark. You go back to the Old Testament, what was the ark? And what did it indicate? What did it show? What did it... Oh, the mercy seat of God. Okay. Uh, where God resided at that time. In their presence. Okay. 
And who who was it in particular that was allowed in there? How often did he go in there? What was happening when he went in there? The high priest once a year offering when they offered the sacrifice. Exactly. Just once a year he's allowed to go in there. The rest of the time it was supposed to be covered up. But it was an indication or a symbol of God's presence among his people, his fellowship with them. And here, when it talks about he sees the temple of God was open, and there is that ark of the covenant of God. Lightnings, thunderings, earthquake, great hail, all those things happening. The idea is that now the temple is open. That temple in heaven is open. The ark is there. God is among his people. God is dwelling with his people. Now, I know that's an alternative understanding to what maybe some folks have studied in the past, but as I alluded to in our last class, if you look at Revelation from chapter 1 down to the end and you try to draw it out linear, a linear progression, to me you start stumbling over things. You start going, wait a second, um, it sounds like he's already talked about this. And where does this fit in? How does this fit? But if you look at it as John in 1 through 11, giving one picture and then backing up and giving the same essential information from a different perspective from 12 to the end of the book, you understand, okay, that's how it blends together. That's how it fits together. So where did chapter 1 begin? What, what's kind of the first thing? We know John identifies himself and he, he talks about I've got this, it signifies, but what's the main, when you read chapter 1, what's the thing that really jumps out at you? Jesus Christ. To Jesus Christ, in what way? In, in his walk, his teaching, his very purpose. Okay, that, that teaching comes in 2 and 3 with the message to the seven churches. But he gives this great picture of Christ and these different descriptions of Him that speak to His nature, right? And then you get the message to the churches. And then chapter 4, what do you have? You have a, a view into heaven. It yeah. You the heavenly world. God sitting on his throne. So you have Christ chapter 1, the message of Christ 2 and 3. Then you have this picture of God sitting on his throne. Then you have the book in chapter 5. What is it that becomes prominent? And he's already been introduced, but he's reintroduced in another way here. Hey, the Lamb. The Lamb is is worthy. He's able to open up these seals to unveil this plan of salvation, if you will. And so then you go from that point to these unsealing of the seals. And with the seventh seal, you have the seven trumpets. And those seven trumpets then blare. They blast. And that carries us through chapter 11. Well, chapter 12 then, where does it open up? What does it begin to talk about? Great sign okay, there's a great sign, a woman clothed. So you're going from this one scene and these events unfolding to you switch over to another scene here. Here's the upshot of it. 1 through 11 is focusing on this message of the revelation with an emphasis on Christ, on God, their power, their action coming in judgment. Chapter 12 and 4 has more of an emphasis, not exclusive, but more of an emphasis on the church, the identification of the church's enemies. You've got the beast from the sea. You've got the beast from the earth. You've got the great harlot. <clears throat> and what I'm submitting to you is these are essentially the same messages. It's not a linear progression, but here's one perspective. Here's another perspective. Here's more details about the church, about the enemies, about these things that are unfolding. And if you look at it that way, because I, I used to look at it as a linear progression in Revelation, and it just it jarred me. It's like trying to figure all that out. 
But if you look at this as what's called recapitulation, look, we're just going to look at it from this other angle. Then it begins to fit together better. Ron. Stephen, the uh, gentleman that I had your favorite study with described it to me as being parallel overlapping sequences. And you may have heard that term as well. Okay. I haven't, but that's a great description of it. Parallel overlapping sequences. Yeah. I like that. Chris? It's interesting when you go back to chapter one and start off that it twice it refers to him as he is the alpha, the omega, the beginning, and the last. So two separate times in chapter one, he's nailing that down right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he sure does. And when you've gone through these seven seals and the seven trumpets, he wraps it up here at the end of chapter 11 saying God is victorious. Just a very quick, essentially, you know, 15 to 19, very quick statement, seventh trumpet. What it's declaring is God is victorious. His cause is victorious. The dead are judged. His saints are rewarded. That's the end. That's the outcome. Paul, you have something? Yeah, Daniel at um, chapter uh, 7, he, he saw a uh, the revelation was given to him too, and he described it a little different, but it's still a great. Yeah, we'll be pulling out some some of Daniel, especially as we progress on in 12, 13, 14, and going forward there. But yeah, there's there's a lot of the um, prophetic language that's put into here. There's some of those connections that you can draw back uh, that are very interesting to explore. All right, so chapter 12, let's read 1 through 5 and see now as he gives us this picture of the woman, the child, and the dragon. Chapter 12, 1 through 5, who will read that for us? Ron. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. And being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. All right, very good. So this woman is clothed in what manner? Verse 1. With the sun. Okay, the sun. Oh, and uh, a crown, a garland, a garland on her head. Okay. And she's standing on the earth. Okay, with the moon under her feet and the garland of what on her head? Stars. Twelve stars. Twelve stars in particular. All right, so um, sun, moon, stars, what do those... Well, we have, we see Joseph talking about that to his father. Um, you know, when he talked about the sun, the moon, and the stars bowed down to me, he was referring to his family at that point. I guess remember that. Right, right. I I wouldn't necessarily connect those here. It's a certain sit uh, had used in Bible accounts in different ways. You just think. <clears throat> To me, when you're right here, sun, moon, and stars, I think of the entirety of the universe, basically, and what we know of. Okay, yeah. It encompasses all heavenly bodies, and in particular, these are light-giving, or at least light-reflecting, right? Okay, so as we go on down in identifying the woman in just a moment, well, I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and identify here, here, because I think there... There could be something interesting about the sun, moon, and the stars once we identify her. So question one, what is the identity of this woman? 
I've always thought it's um, probably a representation of the nation of Israel. Is what I've always thought. Okay. The nation of Israel. Stars represent the tribes. Okay. Any th any other thoughts? Is that the church? Okay, the church. All right, both of you are correct. My okay. Again, I want to reemphasize. I don't. I don't want to be overly dogmatic. Now, anybody who would introduce something that contradicts clear teaching in the Word of God, I'm going to draw a sword and, and, and we'll have issues. But if it doesn't contradict the Word of God and cause an issue or just is completely, I don't know, you may think I'm completely out there sometimes. But, yes, because the woman she shifts as you go down through here it's, it's like there's a change so let me submit to you that she is representative on the basic level of God's faithful God's faithful in Israel God's faithful in the church God's faithful depending on which point in this description that you talk about she would fit that now the child who is the child Christ. Christ is the child. Christ came from among God's faithful. That was the whole purpose of God separating out Abraham and his descendants and then, you know, preserving them, bringing them back out of captivity. For them to have a people there through whom Christ could come, of course, from the tribe of Judah, things like that. But Christ came from among the faithful. So, with that in mind, here's how I kind of see the woman sun, moon, and stars. I see patriarchal age as the stars. There's a glimmer of God's truth being revealed. The moon being what? The old law. The old, the old law. I mean, it, it even refers to it really in that way that it's it's like the moon compared to the sun, right? It's it, it there's more being revealed, but it's not fully there. But then in the New Testament, you have the full light of the sun. You have the full revelation that is given there. So that's kind of just in my mind how I picture this woman and the description of her here. It's God's faithful through all the ages that have brought about or helped to bring about, if you will, this plan of redemption or played a role in the plan of redemption, bringing Christ into the world. Nancy. Well, so in one sense to me, this first picture of the woman is the completed plan. Mm -hmm. Because Christ is referred to as the day star, which is the sun. Okay. And so she reflects his glory from the head down. But she's standing on the old law, which is how it was brought, you know, brought about. Mm -hmm. So in, in one sense, at this very first look at her, it's like we see the completed picture, if you look at it that way. And then later on, when she shifts, you see the plan. Okay. So, this first look at her is he's wrapped it up in chapter 11 and the first look you get is the whole completed glory of the plan in the form of this woman. Okay. Okay. Any other thoughts there? Very good. Well, now we're introduced. You, you got the woman that's put out here and then who comes on the scene or who's brought out in the scene? Dragon. Dragon. Great fiery red dragon. Um, of course, who is this fiery red dragon? Yeah, it's it's pretty well universal. It just jumps out. Hey, here's Satan, and Satan is introduced. He's very powerful. He's very destructive. Talks about you know having seven heads. That would indicate you know the intelligence. Uh, ten horns being what? What might that point to? Okay, power, really strong, right? Ten horns, because horns represent power usually. Uh, and then talks about these seven diadems on his heads. Crowns. And these are royal crowns. Remember, there's, there's a victory crown and there's a royal crown. And the Greek makes a distinction between those two. This is a royal crown, right? Satan has a kingdom. He has a kingdom. We know that. The Lord talked about Satan and his kingdom and having authority in that kingdom. He has that. So 
this makes sense to look at this and say, okay, he's got this great authority. He is the God, little g, of this world. He is the prince of the power of the air. So here he is with his great power. He, he's enraged. He is destructive. He drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And what's he doing in verse 4? What did the dragon want to do? Which is question 2. And why? He, he was depicted as wanting to devour the child, which is to prevent his plan from completion. Okay. He wants to destroy that child. The one coming forth who is going to, as Nancy said, complete God's plan of salvation. To bring it into a reality. He wants to thwart that. And so he's just ready and waiting there, ready to pounce when the child is born. Um, anything come to mind with that? Okay, one, literally, like literally. Now, I want us to understand, it's giving us this picture, and it's what, what's pictured for us here is the birth of the child, and boom, he's gone. He's caught up to heaven. There's nothing in between that's given to us here. But if this is Christ, you know, he lived on earth some 33 years. But be that as it may, he literally tried to kill Jesus in his infancy. You know, back all the way up to Genesis chapter 3, and the Lord had said, you know, you're going to bruise his heel. You're, you're going to go after him, try to destroy him, try to hurt him, try to harm him. And here we see it being described as he's ready to be there to devour the child, to thwart his plan. So you've got literally trying to kill him in his infancy, and then he tried to kill him, or he did kill him, if you will, on the cross. His body was given up um, as a sacrifice. But what happened in all of that? He was resurrected. So what did the devil end up doing? Completing the plan. He brought it about. Right? And that is the beauty of God. His wisdom. That here the devil is. Now understand, the devil has free will. The devil has free will. He just is rebellious toward God to the extreme. And in his working of trying to end God's plan of salvation, trying to defeat that, he plays right into the hands of God. In sacrificing his son, then his son is resurrected. Um, now notice in verse 5, she bore a male child who was to do what? Rule all nations. You back up to Psalm 2 and it talks about Christ ruling all nations with a rod, right? He is the ruler, the one in power. Jeff. The same in the palace. Right, right, yeah, with Moses and yeah. God God's overruling hand in over Satan and his actions and over mankind is, is just a beautiful thing to see. So you you've got him being born, he's the one who's born to rule with a rod of iron. His word is solid, if you will, it's powerful. And the child was caught up to God and to His throne. So you think about that resurrection. You think about Him being brought up. He's, Hebrews talks about He's at the right hand of the throne of God. And Jesus is now sitting on the throne of David. So, you know, He tried to go after Him. It failed. He was caught up to God. He's out of the reach of Satan now. Anything Satan could do. In verse 6 then, what does the woman do? And for how long? <laughs> About two hours, six days. Okay, what's out there in the wilderness? Yeah, what does the verse say? Place prepared by God. It is safety. Okay, again, going back to your Bible history, where did Moses go when he fled Egypt? Went to the wilderness. Where did the children of Israel go when they were brought out of Egypt? went out to the wilderness. Where did Elijah go during the drought? To the wilderness. How long did the drought last? 
1,260 days. Right? Three and a half years. Now, let's understand, when we read about this three and a half years, 1,260 days, and 42 months, however it's described, it is, it is not trying to give us a literal time frame. It's not even trying to say, well, you know, one year for a hundred years or one year for a decade. Or, that's, to me, that's to really miss the point here. Three and a half is the idea of a time that is intense in its suffering and pain, but it is limited. It is definitely limited. And you go back to, to me, the best illustration is the drought that Elijah brought on Israel. It lasted three and a half years. And here it's saying there's going to be this time of intense suffering. The woman, though, is going to flee to safety in the wilderness. She's not going to be destroyed. Any other thoughts there? Joe, you look like you want to say something. No, I was just thinking about when Jesus and his family left Egypt after a bunch of Hezekiah's kids had inherited the persecution. <coughs> yeah. God provides safety and refuge for his people. And that's the image that's being given to us here, that idea. He's, he's providing safety for the woman. So again, we go back identifying the woman as God's faithful. Okay? So the faithful, the child is born of the faithful, if you will. He is caught up to heaven. Well, the woman now seeks refuge and finds refuge, a place prepared by God. God's looking out for her, right? So again, thinking God's faithful. Think about children of God. Now let's read 7 through 12 and see what happens with this woman and with and later we're going to see about the offspring of the woman. But what's unfolding here? How does the dragon react? Uh, 7 through 12. Who will read that for us? Go ahead, Jesse. And a war broke out. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them to happen any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, and so the servant of the Lord called the devil and said, Who deceives the whole world, and is cast into the earth, and his angels were cast with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and to the sea. The devil has come down to you and a great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. Very good. So he talks about this war breaking out in heaven and who does it mention being involved in that war? Okay, Michael. Who's Michael? Archangel. What's the other archangel we have named? Gabriel. Right. Two, two that are named here. So, Michael is there with his angels fighting the dragon, of course, and it says the dragon and his angels fought. So, Satan has a following that's willing to fight with him and for him. And of course, God's servants, Michael and the angels, are fighting against him. And what this is doing is just pulling back that picture on the spiritual realm of there's this great conflict going on between good and evil. So, the things that were happening in the first century in Asia Minor with these churches that was just a part of this great war between good and evil. Um, here he talks about this battles going on, but what happened, verse 8, with the dragon? He lost. Yeah, he, he loses. He can't prevail. You know, and he's just giving us the picture that he was going to war, if you will, against God by trying to attack the child and destroy the child. It didn't happen. He couldn't do that. Now, verses 7 and following here, I kind of see this again as one of those kind of overlapping things. Look, he's, he's got this war. This war's broken out. 
He, he's trying everything he can, but he cannot prevail. He cannot fight against God uh, successfully, that is. So question three I ask, who's the dragon? We know that. What can we learn about him from 7 through 9? What else do we know about him from the New Testament? So when you think about him being rebellious toward God, being the devil, what else does the New Testament tell us about him and the nature of the dragon? He was a deceiver from the very beginning, and he came to deceive the world, and he continues to set forth his deception. Exactly. What does Satan literally mean? Does anybody know? Close. What's that? Adversary. Literally adversary is what it is. And he is an accuser. That's one of the interesting things here. Okay, Ron just said he deceives. So he deceives us to commit sin and then what does he do? Accuses. He accuses us before God. You ever have, maybe when you were younger, hopefully not now, had a friend that got you in trouble and then went and told on you? Or maybe you had a sibling like that. They got you in trouble, then they went and told. That's what it's telling us about Satan. He gets us in trouble. He lures us away. And then he goes and stands before God and accuses us. You kind of get a picture of that in Job, right? When he goes before God. You know, Job, oh, he just, he's no good. He, if you took everything away from him, he'd just curse you. He'd be done with you. That's how the devil is. Yeah. Well, also, the New Testament teaches us that he's a liar. And in Job's case, he was a liar. Job was a righteous man. And he went to God and said, he's not really good. He's only good because you're protecting him. Right. That's a lie. He it, was a good man. He was a righteous man. Exactly. So he doesn't, he doesn't hesitate to lie either. He does not. Totally ruthless. And we see in this chapter, and even in Job, he's a murderer. Yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. He is a murderer, a murderer from the beginning, the Lord said. Chris. He's a manipulator and he's the father of all lies. Yes. Exactly. He will manipulate, he'll use and abuse constantly. Exactly. All right. So, uh, verses 10 to 12 then. It talks about salvation, strength, the kingdom of our God, and of his power have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been cast down. So. When you think about that, uh, it talks about the accuser of our brethren being cast down. What, what is it that the New Testament tells us about Satan? About him being cast down, cast out, or defeated? How about Hebrews 2? Hebrews 2, verses 14 and 15. Do you remember what it says there? Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. I'll tell you what, let's just get someone to read that for us real quick. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Mike. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death, he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Okay. It's talking about that defeat. He, he, he doesn't have this power any longer. When Christ came and gave himself as a sacrifice, that broke the devil's power, if you will. So he's been cast down. He did not prevail. God's kingdom has been established. You know, the kingdom of God, power, have come. The power of His Christ, it's here. It's done. And so the devil can't do anything about that. He can't undo any of that. Joe? Basically, the only thing he can do right now is basically see as many as he can take with him. Okay. And that's where we're headed in this chapter. That's exactly right. Question number four I asked, how, do, how did the brethren overcome the dragon and what practical lesson can we learn from this? So what does it say there? They overcame by the blood of the Lamb. By the blood of the Lamb. By the word of the testimony. By the word of the testimony, of their testimony. And they didn't covet their own lives. They were willing to give their life to serve God. This is the influence that I have. Okay. Anybody you want to elaborate on that? And we have to have the blood of Christ, right? Nancy? Well, I would say it actually 
actually martyred. Many of them were actually martyred. <laughs> so, and that's, that's how they didn't love their life. In a practical sense today, we can't love our life more than serving God. Our life has to be laid down to serve Him. But, so there's a dual sense there, but it, I, I really felt like they were talking about the ones who were martyred here. Yes. Feels like we're finishing up the thought back with the altar scene. Mm -hmm. I'm wrapping that up here. And when sort of the martyr asking for vengeance, it seems that we're wrapping that up here in this final chapter, one of the last chapter too. Okay, yeah, I I wouldn't connect that necessarily with this, um, but they are there before him, and it talks about they overcame him by the blood, the testimony, their love. The, these could be from among the same people, definitely that, Chris. They stay on the straight and narrow path, not afraid of persecution and what would happen. Exactly, exactly. They're they're not afraid of that. We we need to be forgiven by His blood, and then by the word of their testimony. They are out there declaring the truth. They're not ashamed. They're not intimidated. They're out there declaring the truth. And they don't love their life to death. As was mentioned, they're willing to give their lives. These are martyrs. These are individuals who are willing to die. We're, we're supposed to be living sacrifices. Right? Today, we... What kind of things do we face as a result of our faith? Loss of family. Loss of family? We're looked at as the enemy because we don't go along with the ideals of the world. We are the enemy. Anything else? So relationships are broken in the family, friends, things like that. Because if we speak the truth or we stick to the truth, they don't. That breaks that relationship. Maybe problems at work. Maybe um, you know you're kicked off a certain social media platform. So for us, compared to them, it's not as severe, but it's getting more severe as time goes by. And if we don't have this exact same disposition, that we have the word of the testimony, we're out there living the truth, declaring the truth. And if we don't have that desire or that conviction, I'm willing to give everything, including my life, we're not going to make it to heaven. If we fall short of this level of commitment, we're not going to make it to heaven. Because the Lord doesn't take people who are lukewarm. He takes those who are on fire. So we have to look at ourselves. Is this me? Am I this committed to the Lord? And so it says they overcame Him, overcame the devil. If we want to overcome the devil, this is where we need to be. They overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb. Word of their testimony. Did not love their lives to death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Because why? The devil, he's coming. He's going to unleash his great wrath. He knows he has a short time. You know, the devil, it's so sad. Think how smart he is. He knows there's a short time. How much time do we have? Even shorter. Yeah, even short. Our life is a vapor. He is relentlessly pursuing the destruction of souls because he knows he has a short time. What we sh should we be relentlessly doing? Trying to win them back. Try, yeah, trying to save souls. And save our own. Save the souls of others because we have a short time. Very short time. I thought about in the order these are listed. Two are continuous, and one is the end. But the blood is the first thing mentioned.
attention. And even after we have been washed in the blood, that blood is so vital for us to be able to do part number two, which is the testimony. Is we have to we have to be looking at ourselves and accessing that blood all the time. Exactly. In order to do that. And and just to round that out, the blood of the testimony. Okay, when they became a child of God, they were immersed and they had the cleansing blood applied to their souls. Then they lived that out to death. Right? That encompasses the life of a faithful child of God. Alright, uh, we need to move on here. Let's read 13 to 17, please. Who will get that for us? 13 to 17. Go ahead, Mike. And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to earth, persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for a time and times and a half the time from the presence of the serpent. And the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon poured out of his mouth. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children to keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Okay. So uh, where did the dragon turn his attention? This is question five. And what was he trying to do? Okay. Persecute the woman who gave birth to the male child. Again, looking, looking at what's unfolded here, You've got the faithful from whom Christ comes. The devil can't destroy him. He attempts to, but that's thwarted. Now, it talks about how when he's cast to earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the child. Well, wait a second. The woman has all these things have unfolded. Well, if you look at it as simply God's faithful, now God's faithful are the church, are Christians. And he's going after the woman. Think of this as corporate. Going after the entire church. So what did he try to do, by the way, at the very beginning when you look at Acts 4, Acts 5, Acts 7? What's, what's going on there? The persecution of the church trying to destroy those that are teaching and preaching God's word. The apostles are being arrested. Stephen is martyred. Well, you also have just the Hebrews that honor all the faithful, and you can see their struggle with it as well. And they pointed out, you know, the struggle with Satan. All trying to do the right thing. You know. Yeah. At the very beginning of the church, he tried to squash it out as quickly as possible. He tried to do that, but of course, he could not do that. So, what happens with the woman in verse 14? Wings of an eagle. She swiftly flies away. She again. She's given refuge. She's protected. So the church is protected. The church is not going anywhere. Right? When you look at it from the kingdom perspective, you look at Daniel's prophecy about the kingdom of God coming. That kingdom will never fail. It's always going to be here, no matter what. Nancy, you have something? Oh, sorry. Saw it out of the corner of my eye. So, so the dragon then he, he can't he can't do that. So what does he do in verse fifteen? Spews water out of his mouth in an effort to cause her to be carried away. Yeah, he's he's trying to flood the earth to get her to be carried away. Now, the question is, what's this flood? I have. Two things, admittedly things that I've read, I've studied, thought about. But two things I see this could possibly be. It's either a flood of persecution or a flood of error. 